All right. Awesome. Michelle, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to chat with you. And I'm, I'm curious, really, because this show, we talk so much about inspirations, influences. I know that your kind of early study becoming an actor was focused on the stage. Uh, what kind of sparked that kind of creative you know, direction? What, what made you interested in, in being on stage? Um, luckily, just being in public school and being afforded the opportunity for little school plays, which mm. you know, um, is the first thing to go when they do budget cuts in, in public schools, but just being afforded that opportunity. And then we moved a lot growing up, my family. And in one of my moves, I had a teacher, a drama teacher who saw something in me and she asked me to join uh, or to try out for the improv team, theater sports. Gotcha. Ended up getting a spot on that team, which was all senior boys, grade 12 boys. And there was me and one other girl who I was in grade 11, she's in grade 10. And we went on to be provincial champions, which is like state champions and Mm -hmm. then compete nationally. And I was like, oh, this is something that is intuitive for me. Yeah. I just went from there. Well, you you were the fourth of six children. Were, Were you the one oddball creative in the family or was creativity something that was pretty spread out throughout? Yeah, no, we uh, like to, no, not at all. We were all pretty creative and we all like to put on plays. And and um, my sister now, my older sister is a director um, who just has a feature film that came out called Sugar Daddy. And I played a little cameo in there. And then my younger sister is a painter. Okay. She lives in London. So we're a pretty creative family. Were your parents creative? No, no, not really. So my mom came from a painting family. Her grandmother- okay. In Santiago, Chile. So my grandmother, sorry, is is a, is kind of a well known painter in Chile, and her sister. So they're a painting family. But my my mom didn't really get that bug. Yeah, yeah and my dad is a businessman, so not really. But at the same time, you know, being Latin American at get-togethers, my mom was always pulling out the guitar, or like they were musical. Was stage performing something that you thought of, you know, getting to the end of high school, because that's kind of the pivotal decision point is like, do I go business? Do I go that route? Or do I become an artist, you know? And was it something where you thought of that as a viable career path? Or was it just something that was fun to do? I don't think I really thought of it as a viable career path, which is why I, um, I did apply for sciences at UBC. And I don't think I got in. (laughs) And I also, uh, I, so I took a gap year and I thought, let's just try this acting thing. Didn't do very well. And Mm -hmm. I wasn't really enjoying it. I was auditioning for like crappy MOWs and doing some acting classes, but just didn't really enjoy it. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to go to university. And luckily I got into a program at the university of Toronto, Mm -hmm. uh, where I could study theater, but you can do a double major. So I was also studying other things. I studied a bit of sociology and um, history, literature, ended up getting a minor in classical Greek theater, which is just like a random, I just, I'm interested in classical Greek culture in general. Um, So that was interesting. And now I have my BA. So I was like, okay, at least now I have my BA. And if I want, I can go and be a teacher or get my MBA or get my PhD or whatever. It gave me that confidence that I had a degree. Right. But pretty quickly out of university, like within a couple of years, I was working steadily. Looking back, do you regret investing the time into college, pursuing other degrees that now you're not using? Or was it a beneficial time either way? Oh, no, I think it was great. And um, I think even if for some reason you get into the film industry really young, like as an actor or a filmmaker, you know, maybe you stumble on an opportunity or you're a child actor. I think it's really beneficial to take some time off from the industry Hmm. and, and get out and and travel or go to school or have different life experiences. Um, I just don't know how much you can bring as a storyteller when all you have known is the film industry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if that's your whole world is just living in the film industry, I guess you can tell stories about making films, which is interesting. I I actually love those like insider baseball movies. Like I love that. But if you want to be able to tell stories that actually people can relate to, I think it's really important to step out of the film industry to do that. At the beginning of my career, it was just um, the innocence of not knowing that world yeah. and of just approaching acting from a really pure place of, of I want to be the best storyteller and really get into character and and not really worrying about any of that bullshit. Like, yeah. 
it just didn't even cross my mind. Like I remember meeting a, a, a really prominent television director early on when I was in studying theater at U of T and knowing he was a big television director. Um, and he said, well, what kind of acting do you want to do? Fully expecting me to say, I want to do television to impress him so that I could, you know, yeah. try to work with him. And I didn't say that. I said, I just want to be an actor. I want to do everything. I want to do theater. I want to do film. I want to do television. I want to try it all. And I want to be able to do it all. And he wasn't impressed with that answer, but it was just my innocence of like purity of, I just want to act. Right. So when I got uh, diary of the dead, I was a total nobody. Nobody knew who I was. Um, I was just in the right place at the right time. It was just like synchronous and, and something clicked with my audition and, and George, liked it. And, and I, I was, I was ready to go. Like I had seen uh night of the living dead. Um, and I think that's all I'd seen from his films actually mm. at that time. And then I quickly educated myself and, and dove in. Were, were you aware at the time? I mean, obviously now and, and during that time period, I'm sure you realized very quickly, like this is a huge name. This is a, a massive franchise. Was it something you were aware of when you went into the audition? Like, were you aware of who George Romero was and the the kind of legacy already around him? Yeah, no, I was for sure. I mean, I, I even just studying theater, I, I I also I wish I'd been able to study film as well, but my film education has just been uh, on you know just on my own. But I was around enough film school kids um, that I totally knew who George Romero was, and and even though I hadn't seen all his films, I 100% knew the the gravity of that and the importance of, of that going in. But when you're going into an audition, if you see a big name and especially a name that you care a lot about, you have to try to put that aside, like because right. you're gonna, as an actor, um, you're you're going to you should be giving it your all no matter what, whether it's for Wes Anderson or. George Romero or Oliver Stone, like you should be giving it all, even if it's for someone you've never heard of. Right. Because otherwise you're a hack. Like you can't. Right. Was that a big jump going from stage to screen? Um, And, and I, I know diary in a lot of the interviews that you did with George, you talked about how it was a lot like being on stage because there were so many one take kind of natural shots through scenes. Was it a big transition or was it something where it just felt like acting in a different setting? So when I first started doing film, um, it did feel like a big transition and I thought it was completely different, you know, but I had one of my early um, acting teachers. He was a really prominent theater director in Toronto. His name was Ken Gass. And I told him that one day, I said, you know, Ken, acting for film is so different than acting for theater. And he said, no, it's not. It's the same. Hmm. And I was like, no, it is. It's so different. And then the more experience I have, the more I realize it's the same. Hmm. Um, There are different, as an actor, you have different, um, your body is your tool and you have to use that tool differently for film. You have to tune that differently for film than for stage. Um, But it's the same it's the same in the sense that if you don't feel it in your guts, if you're not really invested, if you're not really present, um, then it's not going to work. So it's it's the same. It, it really is the same. But it, it did take some transitioning for me. I had to do some specifically on camera acting classes. Yeah. And I still do. I still do. I still take acting classes just to keep practicing and exercising that. Yeah, it, it's it seems to me like one of the biggest adjustments would be going from having like an audience responding in the moment and mm-hmm. getting to feed yeah. off of that and have that energy and then going to a stage where you're doing maybe a line in a scene or maybe you're doing, you know, you're close up here and, and playing to someone. It, was it was it difficult gauging how successful your performance was in the moment when you first started switching to to the screen because i have to imagine that would feel you know silence is the worst thing to hear when you're on stage did that feel jarring to you going to a set where it is very clinical and and thought through that's a really interesting question because that's 100 percent true that just the start and stopping in film is is hard to get used to and especially you know when you're acting on a play you rehearse 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 and then it's like an hour and a half boom go 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 your adrenaline is super high uh you know even if you mess up or you drop a line you gotta keep going and it's like this energy in it and you're feeding you're feeding off the energy of the audience whereas like in film you you're doing a 12 hour day yeah um and your energy has to be like very stop and starty and you have to, you know, bring it a hundred percent as soon as it's as, as soon as action. 
And you might be going into a really dramatic scene and there's people telling jokes right before you go and there's, you know, crew in your eyeline. And, and, and so it's, that was really challenging actually that transition and it's still challenging for me. Yeah. It's interesting hearing you say it's still challenging or you're still taking acting classes because now, you know, you've been in this world for a while, like you've been performing and you've done a lot of television, you've done quite a few movies and, and have been working through it. Do you feel there's a, a danger in feeling like, oh, now I've got it. Like now I've mastered the craft. Don't, don't, don't like, you know, leadership and professional people say that all the time. Like you have to have that beginner's mindset hmm. and still be learning. But I do find that the environment on set on a film set makes such a big difference to the performances you're going to get. Like, I can't imagine, you know, doing something like the Lord of the Rings and being on a Peter Jackson set and just like those worlds that were created, yeah. how enriching that would have been as an actor, plus all the costumes and the amazing, you know, just like that environment um, must've been really amazing. Sometimes on television, it becomes a bit clinical and you're in a studio and it's a soundstage and you know, people are cracking jokes and smoking cigarettes. It's just like, it, it's not, not as conducive to, to creativity, but no, a hundred percent. Like I, I always feel like I'm, I'm, I'm learning. And especially as a director, I, um, I feel like I'm very much at the beginning of my journey. Now transitioning to director, especially you're starting, I, you're probably watching movies and television in a totally different way. Cause it is educational. Now you're watching performances, you're watching the direction of certain scenes. Who are some of the people that you feel like you're learning the most from as you, as you kind of either watch movies or as you're, you know, I know you shadowed a, a director for a while on, on a couple of projects. Like what are some of the people that you're really taking a lot of inspiration from right now? Um, I mean, it, it comes from all over the place. Um, but my favorite thing to watch is actually comedy, hmm. but, um, but in terms of like filmmakers that I'm inspired by Denis Villeneuve is, is really up there. He's yeah. a Canadian director he you know he did Sicario and Arrival and of course Blade Runner um but he's just like there's something and I think my favorite thing about Denis Villeneuve movies goes back to what I was talking about is the performances he gets and so he must be creating an environment for the actors that's really working and and yeah. I'm sure his direction I saw him speak actually at Com con I went with a short film I made yeah and I was lucky enough to see him speak which is amazing but he's I think he's like a real actor's director and hit the performances in something like Arrival like they're just like they blow my mind and they just really draw you in mm. um but I, like right now I'm watching Nine Perfect Strangers and I'm loving it like it's amazing same White Lotus uh, HBO series are just like television is really pushing the envelope right now and so inspiring. I haven't had the guts to watch Squid Game, but it looks like the performances are amazing. I, I don't know if I can if I'd be able to sleep after that. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, it's it it is wild how good. I mean, I, I was just talking to someone the other day. Like, it's it's crazy thinking. You know, we were talking about Bruce Lee, and I was like, it's crazy thinking that you know people like. Clint Eastwood or Bruce Lee, who are now known as movie stars, struggled to break out of the television mold because television was not thought of as being a high art form like movies were. And now you can kind of cross back and forth like no problem. Like there's so much production value and such great stories happening on TV. We just we just finished watching The Sopranos and I was like, it's like The Godfather is a series. I mean, it's a fantastically yes. done done show. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting it's, it's development. Yeah. Because they don't have the same amount of time, you know, the right. time is not there when you're doing a television show. I mean, obviously the Sopranos much higher budget, a show like nine perfect strangers, much higher budget, but they're, they don't have the same amount of time. They're doing way more pages per day yeah. than a film, way more. And the fact that they can still pull it off is just testament to how good it is, mm -hmm. but yeah, for sure. But I, I, I watch film and television, um, from a director and an actor's perspective. But the truth is, is when I'm really enjoying something, I don't. Hmm. Unless, okay, so sometimes, sometimes if I'm in the mood, I'll be like, oh my God, like the way they frame that shot is why it's blowing my mind. And, 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 and oh my gosh, like the subtlety of that performance and the music, sometimes I'll be in that clinical mood. But often like I, I have two kids, I'm busy. 
uh, when I'm watching something, I just want to enjoy it and like immerse yeah. myself in it. And with the best art, whether it's theater or film or music, you're, you're not cutting it to pieces when you're enjoying it, right? You're just enjoying it. And, and I like to do that as well. I like to just enjoy film. There's a book called The Invisible Cut where it talks about like the best edits you don't notice. Like it just yeah. kind of gets sucked into it. And um, yeah, that, that's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious to so like, Diary of the Dead happened. You go into this horror world, you know, and then you transition to Heartland. <laughs> so 2007. I was shooting the Heartland pilot during shooting Diary of the Dead. Same time. That was, how jarring was that? Because I, I, I have to imagine going from like zombie horror movie to, you know, very wholesome, you know, television series had to be a weird transition. How did you kind of navigate that jump? I mean, the, the good thing is when you when you have a theater background, you do everything. Like you know, you're Lady Macbeth with blood on your hands, and you do comedies, and you do, you're just used to working with every genre in theater. And it that the fact that they were the genres were so different wasn't really jarring for me as a performer. It was a little funny though. I remember telling a friend like I was on the set of Diary of the Dead when I really found out that it was happening that I was wow. going to go to the Heartland pilot, and I had to there's a crazy story. I had to like fly out in a red eye in a snowstorm to go to Alberta to shoot the pilot and come back. I almost wow. didn't make it. And, but ultimately I remember telling my friend when I was on the set of Diary of the Dead, I'm like, I'm going to go do this like Western family, <laughs> like family drama oh. in Alberta. And they're like, what? Oh, like they just thought it was so funny that I was going from, from Diary of the Dead to do that. And, and they said, Oh, you're going to go do little, little mosque on the prairie which is this like canadian show at the time that was mm. like kind of similar and i was like oh man um but i was doing diary of the dead they, they wanted me for heartland but they were at the same time the last week of diary of the dead coincided with the first week of the pilot so the they my agent called me she said do you have any days off on diary of the dead and i was like well i kind of have wednesday off but we're working really late tuesday night till like mm. one in the morning and she said okay okay i'll call you back and she said, okay they're gonna fly you out on the red eye to alberta um, but because it's the middle of the winter and there's snowstorms, they're going to also fly out the second choice to play your part. And if you don't make it, she's going to play your part. Oh, jeez. Okay. I was like, what? And so the second choice to play my part got flown out, met the whole Heartland casting crew. They went out for dinner. They all got to know this other actress. And then wow. I arrived on the red eye, acted all day, flew back to Toronto, finished Iyer of the Dead, and then turned around and came back to finish the pilot. And so the the cast had met this other actress and and thought that she was going to play Lou. And then it was Terrifying. like, surprise, yeah. I, I'm going to play Lou, actually, surprise. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that would be terrifying. That would be scarier than anything I could imagine showing up when everyone's already gotten to know this other person. <laughs> yeah, could it, was, be... it was daunting. But also it just like, I was at that point in my career, I was open to anything and ready for everything. And just like, I was like, yeah, let's go, let's do it. It's a huge series. I mean, it, it's, did you have any sense doing that pilot episode? Like, oh, this was going to be as big as it became and that it would still be running now. I mean, 2021, the show's still going. All I can say is that I did have a sense that something was really clicking, you know, mm. like something was really working. I knew when I auditioned for the part that I felt like a real connection to the character. And as soon as I met, you know, the grandpa Jack and, and the girl who plays my little sister, Amber, there was something where I was like, this feels like a real family. Like what? Like it was almost trippy. Mm. Um, and me and the girl who played my younger sister, we weren't supposed to be getting along on the show and we didn't get along in real life at first but it was fine because it worked and and yeah. um now we love each other but it we it was just like it was life imitating art and uh it felt like it was really really working um and so i'm not i wasn't surprised that it kept going and going and going especially when i started hearing from fans like people really connected with it and often people go to our show to get through trauma mm -hmm. Because the show starts with trauma. It starts with the death of our mother. And then every episode is essentially about someone with their own trauma and their horse coming to the show. And then my sister working with the horse, but really it's about the person's trauma, not the horse. And so I find people feel like it's a safe place to like work through their trauma sometimes. And hmm. yeah, I know yeah. That, 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 that's what I can say about it. 
with a long running series like this, because I think uh, I think now it's 15 seasons. Um, yeah. You, you know, do you feel the pressure? Obviously, you become very familiar with it. And like you said, probably the danger is that oh, we become too familiar and we're a factor and we just crank out episodes. You know, you're smoking a cigarette, telling a joke, and then you do your, your scene. Mm-hmm. You know, but on the other hand, do you feel like the pressure has built up as it's gotten bigger, as the fan base has grown? Do you feel more responsibility and more maybe stress about, you know, where it goes and the and where the characters end up and things like that? For sure. I mean, I don't think we would ever take anything lightly mm-hmm. in terms of like, obviously um, a big thing happened a couple of seasons ago where a main character died. He was yeah. killed. And, you know, I don't think we would ever take that stuff lightly. Like we feel like we're, we owe something to our fans. Right. Um, but at the same time, I don't feel like there's been added pressure in terms of my job or my performance. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like, I feel like there's been more ease right. as I get comfortable with it. And, and the challenge for myself is to like make sure I'm showing up and giving 100% and making it really good. Like season five, I started working with an acting coach again because I was like, I want to bring something fresh and new to this. I want to mm. I want to keep this as I want this to be as as challenging to me as season one. So I started working with an acting coach again late in the, like around season five, six. And again, I think it's the mark of great athletes or great actors or great is when you don't have a challenge on you, when you get to a point where it is becomes really easy, you are a veteran in, in some ways and you place new challenges on yourself to be better. Like, I think that's the mark of someone who's actually takes their craft seriously. And, you know, I, I see that with your career now, because I see this pivot toward directing. Um, yeah. and you've, you've mentioned in interviews you've been building to directing for a long time. Um, was Heartland kind of the first directing role that you took on was that the kind of the first step into that into that realm well i i did do a couple of shorts and i did uh a digital short like a web series that was based on heartland as well gotcha okay yeah that was my first my first forays into directing what was that kind of process like because it is something where it is established you've got showrunners keeping the overall tone of the show going did you feel like you were able to come in with your own creative perspective while also kind of respecting the, the show that already existed? Well, first of all, that was one of my biggest fears, uh, switching, changing hats hmm. that the producers, the showrunner, the crew, the DP, especially my fellow actors, they thought of me as Michelle, the actress who plays Lou. Mm-hmm. And I was daunted by that. And, and I, and I asked myself, will they take me seriously as a director? Will they take me seriously as a leader? Um, Because for 12, 13 years, I've just been the actress. Um, And I wasn't sure if I had the confidence to do that. So that's why I needed to build up a bit of confidence. I did some training as well, did some shadowing, did my shorts, did the digital series, and then finally convinced myself first, yes, I can do this. But stepping into directing on the show where I'd been known for so many, so many over a decade as as Michelle yeah. the actor to Michelle the director was really daunting. Yeah. And I got I was supported by ninety nine percent of the people, but that one percent who didn't support me and who pushed back against me, um, that was really hard. And I I had to process that and just deal with that. <laughs> how how do you process that? Because um, it it is. You know, it's one thing to go in and get buy-in from everybody, but how do you overcome, you know, the one or two that are, you know, really pushing back and fighting you coming into that directorial role? And not taking you seriously and being rude. Um, Mm. That I process that with meditation mostly. Mm. Um, And just in that meditation, reminding myself um, that it wasn't me. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. There was no reason for those couple of people to not believe that I could do it. it right. You know, it was, it was something within them. Yeah. And actually there was one person um, that I, I was working very close with as a director who was really not supportive and was quite unprofessional about it. Hmm. And I ended up confronting him about it the next season and saying, this is how I felt your behavior was. I just want you to know, I think it was really unprofessional, blah, blah, blah. And he basically came around and told me that he had been dealing with all of these things and, and admitting that it was his personal issues that he was 
you know, taking out on me. And so I'm glad that I was able to, to deal with that in a healthy way and, and not absorb it and internalize it. Right. Cause it's well, hard enough. I think being in film and in, in, in any capacity, whatever your job is, is really hard. It's a hard industry. If you're taking a leadership position, um, there's a lot of people who want your job and who are vying for it and who are going to question your abilities you have to have a really strong core and focus. So meditation was really key for me. Just, just remind myself of my own ability. Yeah. Well, that that's so much of directing, right? Like, cause we think about it as like, Oh, it's great. You get to, you know, help guide the look of something or you get to be creative, but you're also kind of the manager, you know, like you yeah. also have to deal with the conflicts and, and yeah. you also have to learn how to address tense situations in a TV show, tight, tight budgets. And, you know, and, and really, yes. you know, short days, you know, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a really important thing to be able to master and it's no small feat, you know, to, to be able to make that, make that transition. It's different when you're doing your own thing. Like if you're directing your own feature, which I hope to do, yeah. um, and I've done it on a small scale with my shorts, when it's your own baby, everyone instinctively trusts you because it's from your mind. Like if you've written yeah. it and you've created it, this is yours. When you're showing up to direct television, it's not yours. Yeah. So you have to earn their trust and their respect. Right. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a different thing on shows. Cause you've got the showrunner kind of plays the role of the director on a movie, you know, they're kind of guiding the overall mission and, mm-hmm. you know, coming into it, you know, how much of, how much of the role, because I definitely want to talk to you about your short, how much of the role within the TV world did you feel like you had kind of control over, like creatively? Were you able to put your own stamp on it, do you feel like? and you know, honestly, and- more than I thought I would be able to, because I, I was kind of like, well, yeah, so much of this is, but really, um, as a director on a show like mine, okay, so th- there are different, you know, I think if, you, if it's Law and Order or something, it might be different, but on our show, because we do so much location stuff. So picking the locations, like I got to pick locations. So so that right there, boom, like that's a lot about the look. I got a huge say in casting. So it's like the people that are on screen, but ultimately when you're visually telling the story and deciding where to place the camera and what perspective to see the scene from, for sure. I feel like as a director, a different director would have done it a completely different way. You know what I mean? Yeah. They would have chosen a different location. They would have cast different people. They would have, they wouldn't have put the camera here. They wouldn't have been told the focus puller to like, let's go out of focus a little bit there, you know, like actually like hold here. This is a static shot or no, you know what? We need the crane. This is like from above, like you really on our show, at least I, I felt like I was hundred percent able to direct that show. Like it's my episode. That's awesome. I didn't, yeah. I didn't write it. And, uh, you know, the showrunners and producers do have final say in, in casting and, and, and in all those choices, they have final say, but I do feel like they respected my choices. And for the most part, I made the decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And beautiful locations. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't oh, pick a better place to get to choose where to point the camera. It's epic. And I feel like with Alberta, my, the short, the feature I'm writing is a Western set in Alberta, a modern day Western. But um, I feel like everyone's finally realizing how sick it is to shoot in Alberta, how amazing. Like when we were shooting this year, it was so busy. There were like a ton of huge U.S. features, a new show under the banner of heaven, Hmm. um, just so many American shows filming there. And I feel like they've all realized like it's it's like Montana, but I think even more beautiful. You know what I mean? And so you're like, oh, Alberta. And it's probably less expensive because of the um, currency exchange. <laughs> right. I know you directed your short, um, and it's very well directed, very well shot. Um, it's a yeah, beautiful looking, looking short. Um, what kind of prompted that? Was it just the feeling of, Oh, needing to try to venture out and just keep doing more of this preparing for the feature or what was kind of the inspiration behind that specific, uh, specific short? Well, um, the actual, ins- well, I, I wanted to do it because I needed to direct something. And I just, I was like, I've got to make a short. And I was looking for an inspiration and for ideas. And I was actually in Los Angeles staying at, um, Jessica Steen's home who plays, uh, Lisa Stillman on Heartland. She plays the grandfather's wife. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I was staying at Jessica Steen's house with her roommate and me and her roommate went and went out for drinks one night in LA and she told me her life story and I was just blown away by it. So that was the inspiration uh, oh. where she had an abusive 
uh, household and basically raised herself. Like she was just telling me stories about doing things as a five and six year old that no five and six year old should have to do for themselves. And I was just amazed. So I said, oh, I want to make a little film about this. And and we wrote the script. I wrote the script and she approved it and, and was happy with it. How did Stephen Amell kind of come into that? Because <laughs> She, the way she described her father was that he was really handsome and strong and, and sympathetic, but kind of just not present. And I thought, okay, I need a great Vancouver actor. And Stephen and I were friends from Heartland because he'd been oh, on wow. Heartland um, really early on in season two. We'd stayed friends. And so I just, I knew as a first time director, I'd be, I, I wanted to work with people I knew. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think everyone, except for the lead, except for the kids, Right. Uh, they were all friends, like people I knew from acting classes or from the television world. And so I, I reached out to Steven and he made himself available, which was really generous because he was on Arrow working yeah. like eight hours a week. He was a, he was a, became a superstar um, really in the last last couple of years. And the, yeah. the main girl in that short is amazing. She's yes. really, really, really good in that. She's fantastic. And she's taken off as well. She's um, all over Netflix on a bunch of different series. And yeah, she's a really talented, talented young girl. Going into now work, I know you're working on developing a feature. It's a post-apocalyptic Western. It is, That's how yeah. it's described, which got me very interested. Um, yeah. What's kind of the vision for that and kind of where in the process is that? I know it's very early yeah. stages, but. Um, still script development, but it's, um, it, the funny thing was it, it paused for a while because uh, I started writing it before the pandemic and it's about a pandemic. And there was a lot of things that were very similar hmm. to what's actually happening in the world that were in my script. And I was like, it just took me a while to wrap my head around it and think like, is this still what I want to do yeah. now that we're actually living through this? Um, and so I've just shifted the script so that it's taking place a few years after the current pandemic. And it's like another wave in a world that's already weakened and how that that kind of just brings society to its knees. The story actually came from being on location one day with Amber, uh, who plays Amy on Heartland. We were out in Kananaskis, like in the heart of the Rockies, and it was just stunning location. And, and we were riding horses and sitting around a fire. And I was like, I want to write a really badass Western with a female lead who has to survive with like her rope and her gun. And she's just like out there. And she thinks that she's just like a Western housewife, but really her skills of like hunting and roping and riding and shooting are going to make her like the ultimate survivor. And that mm. was the, where the, the idea came from. And a good post-apocalyptic story and never goes out of style. You know, it's, it's such a, you've got Mad Max, you've got Romero, you've got all these different yeah. uh, films before. And um, yeah, I, I saw post-apocalyptic Western. I was like, that is a very interesting uh, kind of angle. Um, do you do you lean toward kind of more of the, the darker, you know, you obviously mentioned you like the element of trauma within even Heartland. You'd mentioned, you know, obviously you were in Dire of the Dead, you were talking about this this short do you like dealing in kind of the heavier topics like that no but it just draws me towards it no i i really like actually i love comedy and like mm -hmm. one of my shorts was a comedy i watched a lot of comedy i i actually lean more towards that direction but this story has just evolved this way and it feels true and the truth is is like it's like i said about acting like i don't I'm not interested in, in existing in one genre like mm. that, like for me to death. So this story is, is dark, but it has light. Um, it's just true. And I think life is complicated and life is, it has every shade of color and dark. And uh, I think that as an artist, I'm not interested in only exploring one side. Yeah. Yeah. I always wrap up with a random round and I definitely want to hear your answers to these with how okay. eclectic your work is with how, you know, again, focused primarily on, you know, acting, directing and whatever, wherever that takes you. Uh, I'm curious to hear your answers on these. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, what's a movie that your diehard fans would be surprised that you enjoy? One of my favorite films is called Freeway, starring Reese Witherspoon. It's in Keanu, or uh, oh, uh, a Keeper Sutherland. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you know, I better look up the director's name because I, I I was just looking at his name the other day. He hasn't done much. Yeah. Um, since then, but 
it is the director's name is Matthew Bright. Hmm. And it's just awesome. Like uh, Reese Witherspoon is this white trash, little red riding hood from the deep South. Um, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal savior? Like she's uh, illiterate and she, all she's got like is a handgun from her thug boyfriend. And she's trying to get to grandma's up, upstate. And I just love that movie. I, I've watched it like 20 times. If you were given the green light to remake any film, uh, what would you choose and why? Oh, that's a good one. There's a Fellini film called Amarcord and it's set in this little Italian village. Um, and it's really beautiful. And I think you could kind of set it in a different place. It wouldn't have to be set in, in a small Italian village, but it's, it's, it's about his childhood. Um, and I think to recreate that in a different place would be amazing. I also think it would be really fun to recreate like a classic rom-com, like Sleepless in Seattle. What is the best piece of advice you would give to an aspiring filmmaker who's listening to this? And filmmaker could be actor, director, anyone who wants to to work in kind of this, this realm? Uh, um, my advice would be, well, it... it Depends. Like, I feel like I have certain advice that's specific for actors, um, but I, I guess it can transcend and, and be for anyone. Just to remember, especially for young people, uh, to remember that it is work, and mm-hmm. that there uh, that you need to be really dedicated. That it's not um, it's not about it's not just about looks and confidence because those things can get you to a certain point, but then they dry up. You know what I mean? Like, it's work. You have to be willing to get up early, to study, to look for mentors, um, and to hustle. Hmm. And that really like, uh, it's not for the, the faint of heart. It's, it's, it's a difficult industry. So if you, if you're not sure you can tough it out, you might want to think about uh, pursuing something else. You know what I mean? Like you really have to be drawn to it. Right. Right. Yeah. There's it's show business. <laughs> so there's a lot of, there's a lot of work involved. Well, I, I, don't want to say, I don't want to tell people not to do it. People should definitely go for it and, and, and put their heart into it. If they're drawn to tell a story, they should tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think all the people listening who are supposed to be telling these stories, any amount of restriction or caveat or barrier you put up, they're going to keep going forward because they need to tell these stories. So um, I think it's a really, really valuable piece of advice. And and I really appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. I know you're extremely busy. I know you've got amazing things on the horizon, stuff you're working on right now. Uh, and it means the world to me that you took time to have this conversation. So thank, thank you. So much. I really enjoyed this. Thanks for listening to the Film School Podcast. If you appreciated the content on the show, don't forget to leave a five-star review and hit subscribe so you won't miss a single episode.